I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fang claws coming out through, three inches long, you know, just sharp as they could be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. Oh, wow. That was maybe the best um, 15 minutes that we ever recorded. Probably ever. Well, it, it was 30 minutes, to be fair, because we started recording the actual content of the podcast, too. So, yeah. like, honestly, if this episode is not, like, if, if, the, if the first 30 minutes are lame to you, it's because we wasted all of our juice on the first try on this. It was so good. Just beautiful. Yeah. Like, it, it's... It's the, the, the greatest podcast ever recorded. It was and this the, is just the tribute. Just the tribute. It's the creme de la creme. The cream of the cream. The crop of the crop. The juice of the juice. And and then um, uh, one of us maybe mm -hmm. was only recording the uh, John's audio. And then I was <laughs> recording my audio. And then it was just two John's. Yeah, so there's there's a there is a recording of the the lost content that is just me talking to myself basically. It, it, it's a it was the stuff that was there and the other half that wasn't beautiful, perfect. It was beautiful. Like it was beautiful. We had this whole joke about how like uh it was still May, you know, and like May of uh 2020 it was like we had a joke that this was like an unreleased episode yada 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 well it we didn't still say is an that unreleased episode it is still an unreleased episode technically at this time for another this couple is days. unreleased if you hear this though it is technically released we're temporal ninjas yes we're in a we're in a uh, like supposition of states where we're not released but are released because when you hear this that's how podcasting works. Just like your CEO or whatever had to explain how podcasting works. Oh, they um, have released several more episodes, all of which oh my God. have not been listened to uh, by me. That's <laughs> fucking hilarious. I imagine they're still the same. Uh, we also had, a, we had two stories about poop that I told. They were really funny poop stories. Yeah, there was one about cat poop and one about a human uh, human taking a shit deliberately on a bed. But you know what? Those are lost to the that that's lost to the ether. We don't need to rehash any of that, in my opinion. No, just know John might still have some cat feces on him uh, mm -mm. because that's how that works. No, 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 no. There is no cat feces on me. I took a shower almost immediately. <laughs> <laughs> How's the cat smell? I wiped it down with alcohol. Okay. <laughs> Dakota's I basic I basically wiped my cat's butt today. So that's what I'm dealing with. Um <laughs> it's just a little kitty diaper. Just a little kitty diaper. Just just a tiny little a little itsy bitsy kitty diaper. I'd really dread the idea of ever having to do that because Dakota would never in a million years allow me to do that. No, like, they do that thing where not, like, they walk backwards. Yeah, he would hate it like so much. It would be well, terrible. Well, if you if you like if you put like a rubber band around a cat's like stomach, they basically think their legs are gone. <laughs> I've seen that and feel sad every time. Yeah, it's it's upsetting. I really don't like it when people do it to cats actually. No. It it's kind of mean. It's kind of mean. It's a little abusive. Man, this this is so much more of a downer than the original it's one so, was. Like, it ugh. was so much better. It was like just the best thing in the world. And you know what? You have to believe us on that because we're never releasing it. <laughs> we can't. Well, we can release half. We can release half of it, but like, I'm not. I'm not yeah. gonna release it. Like, I I hold the keys to this metaphorical like lost content because I'm the one who does the posting. It's not going to happen. For, for the That's next, lost content. 
for the next 10 episodes, I'll release 60 seconds at the end, and you have to, the, the listener has to chop them up and com- recombine them. Well, 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 we'll apply a cipher over top of it that you have to crack the cipher, and it's a new cipher every time that realigns the, like, five seconds of audio. You know, it's, it's, it's a whole thing. Yeah, although you and can find the code in an down. audio spectrogram that I'm going to be embedding in this audio file, so then you can import it that. into your own audio software and try to view it. Audio spectrograms are magic, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so let's. Uh, I'm kind of eager to get back to the story that we were doing let's because, like, in. I was hitting, I was hitting a flow. We were um, doing this so is crypto- good. It was so good. Best episode ever. Never going to be seen unless you give me a hundred thousand dollars now. <laughs> There's, in oh, Dogecoin, I create it. In Doge? Dogecoin only, only Doge. I don't accept any other form of payment. If you pay me $100,000 in Doge, I will re-release that episode. <laughs> Actually, honestly, if you pay me a if you pay me $100 in Doge, I will I will post that episode online. There is all If accepts, you want to listen to it. I'll accept uh 50 bucks in Bitcoin too, Jen, from Yeah, Mr. <laughs> Stefan Segal. Yeah, Segal. All right. Um anywho, this is Cryptopedia. Uh it's a podcast about the paranormal. That's why we have that like little thing at the end, a paranormal podcast, because uh, that was an SEO thing that I did very early on in the lifespan of the podcast, because I realized nobody's going to be searching for Cryptopedia cast and our name didn't even hit on cryptids. So like, I was just kind of like, Hmm, how is anyone to find this podcast? There's ever. It was good forward thinking. There, there's a lot of even with the um, the, the the titles and everything in this podcast, a lot of SEO. Yeah, I wish it worked better, but what are you gonna do? Um, anywho, I'm John. I'm Brandon. And this week, Brandon knows what the cryptid is, and he's probably gonna we're 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 changing out the format. We're gonna know now. We're gonna know because we're hitting this point where like, if you devote too much time. To something, it could be problematic because I put literally nine hours of work into this episode. So, like, if I lost nine hours of my labor as a PhD student, uh, that would be bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, Brandon, this cryptid was first sighted in 1935. Its taxonomy is the Chimera, Jersey Devil, and the region is New Jersey. You got to, in fairness, you got that the first time too. So, like. We're going to accept this, but you got you got the very last guessing game. One of these, basically, for the history of Cryptopedia. Um, so much like the Chupacabra, the uh, which, wow, see, this is so much worse than the first one. Um, the Jersey <laughs> Devil uh, has been gestating for basically the lifespan of this podcast, and ironically, I basically bought the book for this episode. When this episode was supposed to release, so yeah. back in that's a thing. Yeah, back back when nothing could ever, nothing worse could ever happen, ever. Nothing. Um. Yeah. May of twenty twenty. Nothing could ever get worse. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It couldn't get any worse than that. After that. Um. That's that's before. <laughs> I'm I'm now realizing that's before the the BLM protests and all of that and like. Right, that was twenty twenty, like June. Yeah, yeah. There, there's um, there, there's. I mean, there, there was there was a few things. There was a few things that happened in twenty twenty after May. Twenty twenty was like you're in a car going down a hill and the brakes don't work, but also it's really foggy and you're like, no. Mm-hmm. And the next ten feet, it's gonna level out. We can't possibly plunge uh, any deeper. <laughs> on the plus side, um, at least now we have fire, so the fog is burnt a little bit, and we can see that it's just gonna keep <laughs> getting deeper. Uh, the the negative is the negative is um the brakes are cut. Yeah, it turns out. Funny you talk about fire because the fires in California are causing all the air warnings here, which is why it was so foggy a few weeks ago. That was California fire smoke just all over. Yeah. So I thought I was seeing the humidity in the air at first that day, and no. then I was like, oh no! <laughs> I found out it was smoke, and I'm just like, horrible. Yeah. Uh but let's let's give everyone a bit of a respite and go into uh, the Jersey Devil a little bit more. Um, 
in my opinion, the Jersey Devil is one of the heavy hitters of the cryptid world. Uh, but that also might be based on the fact that we're loca- our locality is closer to Jersey than it is... Like, every point in Jersey is closer than some points in New York State to us. So, yeah. so, so that like, might uh, have an impact. Yeah. Like, again, like, New Jersey is, like, an hour-ish from here, which is also the same distance as to, like, a decent mall from here versus, like, my cousin who's also New York who's five hours away. And um, <laughs> Jersey Devil, at least from where we are geographically, it's, yeah. it's an A-lister. It's, it's like a... A Brad it, Pitt or a I, or Andre the Giant of cryptids. It's honestly, it's honestly about equidistant between the Jersey Devil and the Dover Demon for us. I think roughly, like back of the envelope. Okay, because like Dover Demon's Mass- Dover, Massachusetts. Jersey Devil's Pine Barrens. So yeah, that's that's roughly it. Um, but regardless, um, as has been noted multiple times on the show, I am cosmically drawn to new jersey and for whatever stupid dumb reason i always am the one who covers the jersey cryptids because actually no that's not true I you covered one. the jersey aliens once i did aliens once and i and the um the lizard man had a a, a little bit of new jersey in it mm, true 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 okay I'll, I'll give you that but uh, so, anywho, we're going to have one main source which details the history of the Jersey Devil this week. Uh, that is The Secret History of the Jersey Devil by Brian Regal and Frank J. Esposito. I'm going to be skimming through a lot of the details, so, like, they go into a lot more depth on a lot of topics. Uh, so, if you enjoy what you're listening to and you want to hear more about the story, uh, for sure, get the book. It's on Amazon. Um, I'm sure there's other places you can get it that are less Amazon. <laughs> if that's a thing that you care about. Um, but it, it's it's a well-done book. It's interesting. It, it reads well. Um, and as an aside, while I don't think Brian Regal is a listener of the show, I could be wrong, uh, I do follow him on Twitter and he follows me back. So uh, shout out to at Tarbosaur. So uh, he's a pretty cool dude. And uh, he's been getting death threats because of a vaccine op-ed, which means... He probably wrote the right thing on the vaccine op-ed. Yeah, most likely. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, like any good legend, there is a bit of fuzziness around the edges of the origin story. Like of a the nice Devil. moldy piece of bread. Yeah, it's it's basically a moldy piece of bread around the origin. Um, now, certain details are maintained between tellings, while others are lost or distorted or enhanced, punched up. You know, the the whole thing. That's just how urban legends evolve in our society as, you know, because we're in a society. Uh, (laughs) I'm now remembering the Davy Jones meme that was posted in the Discord chat. Oh. (laughs) You better start believing in society, boy. You're in one. As Davy, as, uh, as the, not Davy Jones, uh, Blackbeard, as his face turns into um fucking uh the joker that was a bad <laughs> joke this is this is so much worse this uh, brandon this is what i get brandon, for not double checking my settings this this i got thrown off my juju uh, which i don't think that's a good thing to say i, I don't I know where it comes thing. from i think i said so we, we plead we will plead ignorance until further research i'm going to i'm going to say that i'm not going to say that anymore Um, So anyway, here's my preferred telling of the story as adapted from Cohen's Folk and Folklore of New Jersey by Brian Regal because I couldn't find the fucking original book. Sue me. Um, In 1735, a witch known as Mother Leeds found herself pregnant for the 13th time. (coughs) The cough is important to the storytelling, by the way. Um, Breaching, she called out in agony, Oh, let this one be a devil. The child then emerged with a horse-like head, bat-like wings, claws, and hooves. The creature yelped menacingly, then flew up the chimney and off into the forest, where it spent the next several centuries harassing and attacking unfortunate travelers. Now, Brandon, this story absolutely reeks of folklore, right? We got the number 13. We've got the only named character being a witch. And we've got the devil. You know, all the all the spicy, essential things for a... Uh, colonial era piece of folklore right yeah like yeah. 
Honestly, I well, can't think of anything that's missing other than a little bit of bloodletting. Um, maybe some rotten teeth. Uh, and like treading on uh, indigenous people's rights. Those are the things that we're missing. And then we'll have the most American like. Yeah, well, that comes story that, that last part comes with the colonialism. Um, yeah, that's that's actually going. Yeah. That actually does play a factor in the story. Is, so, so not. here's a, a a really broad question, and that's sure. What's the relationship between hoaxes and folklore, and is it sometimes only time? Right. So, if something um, is a hoax, that's just perpetuated from in in possibly this case we'll see the colonial era does that just transition yeah. to folklore eventually because it's so like old all right so folklore is like stories that are passed through generations by word of mouth right yeah so like a hoax can become folklore because it's a story passed by word of mouth, it gets embellished, it gets changed, it gets ad addressed. You lose the fact that it was a hoax, et cetera, et cetera. It eventually accrues societal, um, not significance, but it, it enters, it, it it ascends in a sense. Yeah, I don't think every hoax is necessarily folklore, though. Right? No, um, because folklore, and not every piece of folklore originated as a hoax, right? Yeah. So it's it's one of those things. Uh, it's kind of like the whole uh, is a rectangle is a square a rectangle. Yeah. Or was it a, a, a rectangle a parallelogram? Like all rectangles yeah, are parallelograms, yeah. but not all parallelograms are rectangles. Are rectangles? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. That's that's the that that's that's one of the ways of looking at it. Um. So like a hoax, on the other hand, is like a willful intention to falsify data and falsify an event right um it's it's the boy who cried wolf effectively that is the hoax the folklore is the retelling of the story when the boy cried wolf yeah right um now so we're doing keep a in mind, folklore right now we are in essence doing a folklore right now in talking about the jersey devil we are slightly modifying the story right because i'll probably get I'll state things probably a little bit off, right? Or like through a lens, another lens. And then you'll listen to this podcast or, or well, you'll listen to me and people will listen to this podcast and then they'll have a new thing to say about the, the Jersey Devil and it might modify the story a little bit. Uh, I'm all, I'm already guilty of modifying the story a little bit as it stands. Um, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, so, also, I want to keep in mind, I am not a folklorist. I'm a social scientist, but I'm not a folklorist. They're very different. Um, I study phenomenology around, like, people's interactions with things. This is a whole other branch of science that we're talking about here. Um, and I just want to, like, caveat that I am not, this is not my area of academic expertise, but I have a passing interest in it, so, which is this podcast, effectively, I guess. So it's, I guess it's a little less than passing. Great, it's greater than passive. Yeah, most yeah, yeah. people don't take an interest in um, topics like this and go past like shallow searches. Most people don't take a a, 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 a topic of interest like this and then just write an essay every other week. Yeah, yeah. No, this is. This is this is an essay. Um, so, anywho, the, <laughs> that's a, that's enough of a diatribe. Uh, so, the base story is embellished or modified depending on the teller and the circumstances, right? So, like, if you're talking to a certain audience, you might change the story up a little bit. If you're talking to another audience, you might say this: If it's certain time, certain elements of the story will be changed to be more palatable for the audience you're listening, like talking to. Like, maybe if you're talking to a kid, you might not go as gruesome. Or you might go more gruesome, right? Depending on the kid and depending how much you want to scare that child. Um, depending on how much your insurance covers therapy. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, like, really, let's be real. No matter what you do, the child's probably going to need therapy because you're probably going to fuck something up. That's just, oh, yeah. that's just the facts of life. Now, regardless, uh, 
the story has multiple like variables to it. For example, mother lead curses the child before it's been born in some cases. So like the story I just told, she curses it before it's been completely delivered. Um, and then in some cases, she even curses it before it's been conceived, right? So just a kind of wild thing because it, it those two things have different implications in different times. Then in another <laughs> telling of the story, it's just how she role plays. Yeah, I mean, pretty much, <laughs> pretty much. I mean, like to me, any child is. To me, if it's a child that I'm associated with that has my genetic material, it's already a cursed child in my opinion. Oh, yeah. Um, But that's just me. That's my personal opinion, you know? But whatever. Uh, Whole lot of mental illness in that child. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, in another telling, uh, a preacher curses mother leads after being cursed themselves by the named witch. Um, which results in a curse cast upon the child. In this telling, as recounted by John McPhee, the Jersey Devil then lives with its parents until age four and kills them before entering the woods. Um, so, you know, it's basically just an accelerated uh, teenager at that yeah, point. True. Pretty much. I mean, like, really, like, it just has the tools to, to kill its parents, you know? That's the only difference between a normal teenager. I think all normal Unless teenagers they're in Texas. have access to... Yeah. True. I mean... True. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that was really compelling audio. Um, so the location in which Mother Leeds births her monstrous spawn is even subject to interpretation. Now, sometime, most of the time, creatures in the Pine Barrens. Like, the majority of all stories are in the Pine Barrens. Sometimes it's near Burlington. Sometimes it's near Leeds Point, which is like on the shore near Atlantic City. Um, Regardless, uh, it's always been like, like prior to 1909, it's referred to as the Leeds Devil. Right? Um, Ostensibly, this is the result of Mother Leeds' name. Although, as I'll talk about in this episode... I think the opposite is true. I think Mother Leeds gets her name from the Leeds Devil. But we'll get into that in a second. Um, I do also want to note that I have heard fringe accounts that placed the Jersey Devil in a previous Cryptopedia episode's location, which is uh, Clinton Road. But that's not true at all. There is no evidence of the Jersey Devil uh, like origin story originating there. No. Um, there might be sightings because it's one of those things where if you live in Jersey, you might see it because you're um, just, just expecting if you're just yeah. ex- you're kind of expecting to see it. Right. Yeah. Like or like it's a it's an easy excuse for something, basically. Um, yeah. But regardless of the telling, Mother Leeds is a scapegoat. And as noted in um, this is this is noted in the secret history of the Jersey Devil. Um, for fears about witches, non-Christian, and women. The origin, devil, the origin story of the Jersey Devil is deeply coded in misogyny, but the circumstances that led to its inception are convoluted and lost in this like haze of forgotten history. Now, I want to point out that in this episode, I'm taking a very hard stance on the Jersey Devil. In my opinion, it is a folk legend turn hoax. So we're getting into that whole difference between folklore and hoax. I think the folk legend appeared before the hoax. Oh, you think the folklore superseded the actual hoax bit? Yes. I I 100% believe that. And um, that's just what I read in the book. Plus my own independent, like looking around. I think that that's a a defensible point of view. Um, In all honesty, it's basically a fearsome critter. But it doesn't have a clean explanation like most fearsome critters. And that's the key. Uh, A lot of the parts of history for this are forgotten. And they're forgotten because of the way the history was shaped. Right? Um, This is no mean feat, the research that was done by Brian Regal and uh, Frank Esposito on this story. uh, Because a lot of these things are like 
kind of fringy and hard to get like a good like handle on. You have to like really trawl through the archives to get them. Now, uh, and I've got a little picture of the Jersey Devil there who is just so sexy. Just terrible. Just terrible in every way. Well, I guess There's we have different opinions. Horse bat. It is a horse bat. It's it horse is a bat. horse bat. It is a horse bat that has skipped leg day, arm day. Really, <laughs> really just yeah. every day has been skipped by this bat thing. Like, it's just, it is. It's something. It, it's suffering to live. Yeah, it's, like, it's a Mr. It, Me Seeks. Yeah, I feel like I feel like it would be a kindness to put this thing down. Yeah, because like I just don't know how it survives. It's um, really and that, the, the, that's <laughs> the way the Jersey Devil scares and attacks people is it flies out of a wood screaming, "Kill me, please, please kill me!" And then just people run in fear. <laughs> I mean, fair. Um, and actually, I want to ta- touch on that a little bit. The chimera nature of the Jersey Devil. Uh, is also a part of why I'm taking a hard stance that this is folklore and like I'm not even entertaining the idea that it's an actual cryptid um because like unlike chupacabra loch ness um sasquatch there isn't like a morphology to it that exists there's no analog that exists chupacabra <laughs> has dogs loch ness has plesiosaurs and of course uh sasquatch is big hairy guy there's, so I I don't know how true this is, um, but it does pertain to the the morphology of the Jersey Devil. And there's that mm-hmm. thing about would you rather fight a a horse sized duck or a hundred mm-hmm. duck sized horses or whatever. And um, yeah. I heard, and I don't recall where that if a horse, uh, if a duck were to be the size of a horse, the the weight of its meat would cause its hollow bones to break. <laughs> so. Yeah, There's the potential. I'll take the I'll take the duck size horse. Yeah, I'll take the duck size horse any day because it sh- sh- its bones should just be shattered. Um, this thing would be incredible pain all the time because all its bones is broke. Yeah, I mean that explains the screaming. That ex- it does explain the screaming. It really it really explains the screaming because like it's just constantly in pain. Um, but anywho, so onto the pine barrens now. If you're not from the tri-state area, you might not be familiar with the Pine Barrens, and that's fine. That's why I'm going to tell you about them. Yeah, guess what it has a lot of? Pine trees. Actually, it's oaks, but, you know, no one would have ever guessed that. (laughs) I'm ashamed. I, I have been doing this. This is the 98th episode of this fucking podcast. And I burped. Oh, yeah. What am I doing, Brandon? This is amateur uh, no. hour. We try. We do try. It's not for lack of trying. All the technical issues and different things that go on. It's not for lack of trying. It's such an easy show to record. Like, the easiest show to record, and we fuck it up every time. <laughs> uh. Anywho, so the Pine Barrens appears to be the point of origin for most of the stories about this monster. Uh, the region is an Atlantic coastal pine barrens uh, and the area has sandy acidic soil that is infertile and it's located roughly in southern jersey Uh, in modern times the region is miles of uninhabited woodland and it makes for a very popular body dumping ground for the likes of mobs and killers of all walks of life hell yeah i don't think it's been as i don't think it's been as prolific recently but it was pretty pretty Hardcore back in the day. And in fact, um, the usage of the Pine Barrens as an illegal dumping ground is central to the part, the plot, of Hunter Shays, the Jersey Devil, and it has little bearing on the origins of the creature. So, like, there's there's nothing to do. Like, like it, there's no need to worry about any modern connotations of the Pine Barrens in this, this particular story. <coughs> um, so... For the actual origin of the creature, we have to jump to the pre-Columbian inhabitants of the region. The Lenape people, also known as Delaware. Uh, So, like, if you've been in a history class, they're usually... Like, when we were in history classes, they referred to them as the Delaware people. Um, But Lenape is their original name, and because I'm talking about them in the context of their pre-Columbian... There's... uh, It's... 
it wasn't until we started doing this podcast that I realized a lot of the things that we learned in history about what people were called was because that's what white people called those people. And I not mean, what they called themselves. To be honest, we've called people slurs. Like, yeah, and I should have seen like, that coming, but like for the indigenous people of Alaska and like the north, yeah. Pretty much the typical way that people call them is a just a slur. Yeah. Like it's just a slur. Don't use that word. It's it's not good. Um but anywho, the, uh, the, the Lenape of the colonial era had a rich cosmology, believing in the existence of both good and evil spirits in hopes that they would maintain a balance with the evil spirits. And I skipped a whole bunch of stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so they had a rich cosmology in which there were good and evil spirits which inhabited the world, right? So it's it's a very, like... Uh, there is balance in the world, right? It's there's another good, one of those, there's like, evil. there's good, evil, uh, there's, like, a balance of nature, and that's it's, explaining... It's, it's gray areas, really. Yeah. Right? Um, so, in Lenape spirituality, it was marked by, like, paying homage to good spirits in hopes that they would maintain balance with the evil spirits, right? Because, like, you want balance. You don't necessarily want all good, you just want balance. Yeah. And, like, there's something kind of poetic to that for me um and in their cosmology they do have an all-powerful like god in quotes known as the manito or the kishile mukang which could control all things however it would be incorrect to consider this analogous to either yahweh or the devil um and as their religion is polytheistic in nature uh, comparisons to monotheistic religions such as Christianity are generally inappropriate and like I can't stress this enough don't compare monotheistic religions to polytheistic religions you're just gonna do it wrong yeah they're it's they're just they're different things so don't, don't just, like it's apples and oranges yeah don't, like, don't use them as comparisons different. um <clears throat> and frequently the fact that they were more polytheistic, more spiritual minded, uh, that's used as a justification for the subjugation of indigenous people. For example, I want to take a quote from John DeLate, which described the faith of indigenous Americans in, in 1633. They have no worship of God. They indeed pay homage to the devil, but not so solemnly, nor with the precise ceremonies as the Africans do. Now, I want to highlight this quote. Because it's very important to the Jersey Devil story, believe it or not. Um, in this, John DeLate is comparing them to the devil. He's associating the Lenape people with the devil. Or rather, he's associating indigenous Americans with the devil. I don't think this was specifically about the Lenape, but I could be wrong. Um, so, in doing this, he's making them an other. Right? Which is a problem. Yeah. Because when you make someone an other, when you associate someone with evil, um, it becomes easier to do horrible things to them, because it it short it it it, it bypasses that part of the brain that uh, has empathy for people, because you're re you're reconfiguring them as not people in your mind, and like. Not only that, but this is like as I said, a fundamental lack of understanding of the indigenous faith. And, like, basically these writers are creating the indigenous Americans as infidels and heretics. They're equating them to witches, effectively. And now, while this is not apparently a non sequitur, uh, the use of the devil in insulting or denigrating people in the colonial era is actually crucial to understanding the origin of the Jersey Devil. It, it's wild, but it's, like, super important. Um, yeah, so like, it, it, I can't, I can't stress enough how important it is to know that, like, that is a common way of insulting and denigrating people, is comparing them to the devil. Yeah, so for, I guess in a more general sense, that the, the Christian colonials, they, um, any, for, if anyone is to apply any spiritual significance to something that is not the Christian god... Because they're Christians, if it's not that god, then it is the devil. So any non-Christian spirituality is, in fact, 
devil worship. Um, that's also unchanged in evangelical belief today. Like, oh yeah, that that's still unchanged. Completely, that's completely a thing, right? Yeah, because like they've ex- like I'm pretty sure that quote I just read uh, was read to me in a Sunday school class as like a justification for why the devil exists. Yeah. Or like a a variation on that quote, maybe not including the the Africans bit, but like there is a mimetic mutation of that quote that was read to me when I took Sunday school classes as a child, and like it was used as a justification, like even even all of these like you know quotes savages recognize the existence of the devil, but really they're not. They're it's a totally different thing that they're describing. And yeah. it's a personification of the natural forces. It so, is. like, and, and that's also don't... why it goes hand in hand with colonialism. Because from their perspective, yeah. it is they're doing the devil worship, and in order to save them, it is their duty, your duty, to convert them to your religion, so that they can be like that. That's why the yeah, it's, they, they go it's, hand in hand with colonialism. It's it's super fucked, right? But we'll we'll move us away from that because. We're getting too close to why I didn't want to talk about the Wendigo episode. Oh, boy. Like, we're getting too... The, we're, our discussion right now is getting a little bit too close to Wendigo talk and, like, why I don't want to do Wendigo. So let's let's steer this... Let's steer this uh, this whole thing back a little bit. Um, more linearly connected to the Jersey Devil, the Lenape also engaged in ceremonies honoring a forest god known as Nsing. That's M apostrophe S-I-N-G. I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce that. Um, the deity was described as a deer-like creature with leathery wings or as a deer being ridden by a man. Oh. Now, the description is not too far off from the description of the Jersey Devil in the Mother Leeds origin story, which kind of suggests a sort of cultural transmission between the Lenape and the European colonists may have occurred sometime which embodied the mysteries of the forest, Right. Um, and I will, I do want to point out that is a very different, like deer like creature with leathery wings and a deer being ridden by a man, two very distinct things. Yeah. They're two very distinct things. Well, one is close. Oh, I like this. Right. So yeah, b- I- before we go f- too much farther, yeah, my present or, or, or at least up until now, my present thoughts on the Jersey devil was what I'm sure you'll touch on was the colonial, uh, version with the back and forth in the newspapers and, and mother leads and, and that which you, you may touch well, on. But so I didn't the, know any yeah, of this. We're going to touch on that existed beforehand. That that was so, what I thought. The hoax part is what I thought came first. Well, but so I'm, it's not even it's not a direct line, right? This is you're you're right. Like this is like a thing that people don't know about because like of course you don't know about it, right? Because, like, it's not as enthralling as the Mother lead story. Yeah. You know? Um, but the most important thing um, about this is, like, it's not the... It's not the origin of the devil, this devil, but it's, like, a... It's a seed, right? It's a seed that's very important to acknowledge, in why the devil looks the way it does. Yeah, it, it's a puzzle piece to the path of how we got yeah. to the devil. Exactly. It's 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 a step. It's a drop in the ocean. You know? Um yeah. it, it's it's a part of the the primordial primordial soup that gave birth to the Jersey Devil. And honestly, it's a part of the reason why the Jersey Devil existing in some form, um, was just kind of like a foregone conclusion. Um, the way it manifests is the way it manifested, but like, given all the stricture and the structure that had been set up around the in Jersey around this area, it was kind of inevitable that a Jersey Devil like creature would emerge. Because like, the um to European Ameri- to European settlers, the Pine Barrens are kind of inhospitable, right? It's got bad, like, farming land, it's arid, it's acidic, you know, like, you're not going to be able to do a lot in them. And, like, that's kind of codified by the fact that it's still relatively it's underdeveloped. still nothing today. Yeah, it's just yeah. vast expanse of And Chris Christie was the... 
Chris Christie was the governor of New Jersey. You better believe if it was worth building shit there, he would have torn shit down and put in like. If there was a way to monetize it, it would have been monetized. It would have been monetized. Like this is the dude who shut down a bridge to get revenge on someone. So like, yeah. listen. But regardless, um, that is a very astute point that you point out, though, Brandon. It is explicitly a piece of the puzzle that gets us to where we need to go. Um, because the leap from the thing that people think is the origin of the Jersey Devil, um, like, like the, the, the subcontext of it uh, is kind of completely insane that it goes to, like, a winged monster thing. Now, also, like... There was imagery in like Christian iconography of a thing that looks similar to the Jersey Devil, but that's a whole nother thread that I'm not going to go down. <laughs> um, Brian Regal and Joe and, and Frank Esposito go into it though, so like by all means, if that's interesting to you, read it. Um, but obviously, the Lenape were not the only habit inhabitants of the Pine Barrens in the 1600s. Uh, the arrival of European settlers happen, and the Religious Society of Friends, or Quakers, which I'm going to use for short, uh, would settle in the Pine Barrens. And they had a particularly prominent settlement in Burlington, New Jersey, which kind of brings us to the real origin of the Jersey Devil, the, like, start of it. Coat it all factory. starts with the Quakers. The Quakers and the Coat factory? Coat factory. What? Coat factory. The Burlington Coat factory? Oh, come oh. on. Come on. What about their oat factory? Oh, the Quaker oat factory. Why Why are Quakers associated with things that end in OAT? Uh, oh, God. Were the Qu Quakers behind Vote? V-A-O-T? That, like, awful website? I don't know what that they is. I'm, I'm joking. It's, it's, it's a bad joke. Bad joke. Um... <laughs> Also, like, I want to say something, like, so, I was researching the Quakers, I made sure, so generally, like, speaking, the Quakers are kind of chill, right? Yeah. Um, but, like, like, because, like, they would, like, streak effectively, and, like, I'm gonna get to this in a second, um, but, like, even though they were on the right side of history for, like, abolitionism, they were still racist as fuck. Like, I want to, I want to point out, like... I know that this may seem unimportant, but, like, it's important to me that we don't forget the fact that just because you don't want people to be owned doesn't mean that you're not a racist. Yeah, there, there's a lot of, um... There's a lot to that. There's a lot of, in what we learn in school, of shining lights on just the good parts of things and mm -hmm. kind of ignoring yeah, we... other bits. We we shine the lights on the good parts and tell people not to uh, pay attention to the shadows. Yeah, never mind the man behind the curtain. Yeah. Yeah, pretty yeah, much. The, and the, actually... There's a, a road made of gold and just ignore everything around it. <laughs> I mean, that's the American dream, right? Yeah. But um boom tis <laughs> um, So, as a brief overview... The Quakers are a generally nonconformist denomination of Protestant Christianity. Uh, they generally elevated the individual over the clergy, and the group is characteristic. It, it's characteristically believed that everyone embodied God. Thus, clergy were generally unnecessary, which makes for a generally flat power structure. Um, and as I said before, they're historically on the right side of abolitionism and pacifism and a few other things. But like, that also doesn't make it make them like shining, shimmering examples. They like just believed a few things that were rational. Yeah. Right? Like like which kind of goes to how terrible certain humans are. Um, but it also it also is very important because it highlights the fact that people still thought it was fucked up that people owned other people. In oh, the 1600s. Even back then, yeah. Yeah, it was not It was not a uniform thing where everyone was okay with slaves, which makes the slave owners much worse. Like, so I, I, much worse. I, I, I think you said founders of the country wrong, but continue. True, true. You're, you're <laughs> right. You're right. I, I am incorrect. My, my uh, speech is wrong. 
Um, anywho, Daniel Leeds was born in England sometime in uh, 1652. I think the estimate is like sometime in November. Um, and he began his life in the Anglican Church, eventually converting to Quakerism before moving to Western New Jersey. Basically, as a kid, he had these like visions and like the Anglican Church kind of ignored him when he went to talk to clergy. His parents were already Quakers and like a whole thing with Quakerism is like you have to personally choose to go into Quakerism. Yeah. So like he was still Anglican. His parents were Quakers. Um, and like the Quakers were more receptive to his visions and like his spirituality and stuff like that. So he moved in to the Quaker religion. I think uh, I'm going to be really misquoting something from that. I yeah. found read years ago, but mm-hmm. I think um, they, someone tried to do, they, they looked deeper into the descriptions of his visions and what was happening to him during the times that he had them. And I think he was, I think they were like little like seizures or, or he, I think they, they, they surmised that he may have had, cause you can't, there's no way to tell um, some medical condition going on that was causing these. I mean, that's, that's generally the hypothesis for like a lot of uh, people who have visions, like prophets are like, that's a very like, reasonable grounded in fact like grounded in reality um approach to assessing people who have visions right yeah um is stuff along those lines where it's like it's just a normal biological process that's gone awry in some way so um but regardless uh daniel Leeds was an autodidact right um he had a profound interest in the scientific revolution as well as astrology and now I want to point out at this time, astrology was still considered like n- sciencey, right? Like Isaac Newton practiced ast- astrology, so it wasn't like quite. People hadn't really gotten on board with the fact that it's kind of a little bit dumb to think that you know. Oh, that like you know. if you're a Taurus or if you're a Michelle, that yeah. you yeah. whatever happens. Yeah, it's it, people haven't quite gotten to that phase yet in history. People so, like, still haven't left that phase. That's true. That's true. But like most scientists don't ascribe astrology as science. <sighs> that's such a Libra thing to say. I'm not a Libra. That's such a Taurus thing to say. Not a Taurus. That's Wait, such an Aquarius thing to say. I'm pretty sure I'm an Aries. Uh, you've like guessed <laughs> you've guessed like everything but Aries. Like the you've pretty much guessed everything but the thing I am, Brandon. Yeah. Which is kinda hilarious. <laughs> um Regardless, uh he arrived in Burlington, West Jersey. Uh not West Philadelphia, I should point out. Uh around sixteen seventy seven. Daniel Leeds was a fairly devout Quaker, like actually incredibly de- devout. He donated four pounds to the first Quaker meeting house in Burlington. Now, Shoot. that might not sound a lot to you, but in today's money, that's about a thousand dollars. Yeah, inflation's a bitch. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in the course of his life, Leeds acquired Leeds Point on the Jersey Shore and mourned the loss of three lo- three wives having married four times during his life. So pretty bad track record um ironically however the jersey devil story begins with daniel Leeds' propensity for publishing his thoughts to spread knowledge particularly of the scientific revolution and the resistance of the quaker community to them so brandon the jersey devil has its origin in somebody trying to spread science Oh, and because science is the devil, and no, I'm so happy that we've come so far, and everything's totally different, and science isn't the yeah, devil everything's anymore. Yeah, so uh, everything's so much better now, right? Uh, like, uh, yeah, so, <laughs> this thing that people believe in, because people still do believe in this, I'll get to that in a second, um, I'll get to that in a while, uh, people still believe in the Jersey Devil, but it, like, is rooted in a rejection of science, but like yeah. a it's, it's rooted in like a lampooning of science almost, but we'll get there in a second, a corruption of science, if you will. Um, 
1687, with the help of William Bradford, who was a printer and fellow Quaker, Leeds printed to the first almanac in New Jersey, which ironically, like, so histories of almanacs ignore the fact that Leeds printed an almanac sometimes. And, like, they oh, cover good. later, they, they cover, like, 1700s era people as the earliest cases. So, yeah. like, this dude is, like, chronically forgotten. And we're going to get to that in a second. Um, so his almanac was called the Leeds Almanac. It was a single page broadside, which was cheaper and easier to produce. And it featured titled information for Philadelphia, the setting and rising of the moon and witticisms as was common at the time. Right. It's yeah. honestly, there's a screen, there's a picture of it in, um, the book and it's there's, like, what's a witticism? The, I tell me in a 1687 witticism, like what's an old timey joke? Uh, Jeez, I Brandon, I'm not a witty person, and I don't have any. Let me pull you. Let me get a Benjamin Franklin witticism, which is going to be ir- ir- ironic in a second. Meaning, love your enemies for they tell you your faults. He who falls in love with himself has no rivals. That's a pretty good one. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. Um. So, like, it, it's a way for the almanac person to, like, spread their personal beliefs. They interject their own personal opinions and, like, yeah. things that are important to them. Like, it's kind of a way to spread knowledge through this thing that is actually used by farmers, right? Because, like, calculating the, the rise and fall of the sun, the moon, all that stuff, um, tidal flow things, those are all actually super important, right? Oh, yeah. We don't have to... We don't do, worry about it as much now because we have a phone that automatically gives us those things. But, like, back in the day, like, almanacs were key and, like, vital to farming and agriculture. Oh, yeah. They, they literally least, told you the exact amount of time that you had to, one, perform your work, and two, yeah. the, the, your deadline to have that work done before the season exactly. would change. Exactly. So, very important to European agriculture, I should say. Because... Almanacs weren't necessarily used in other cultures, but in European cultures, it was frequently used. Um, The Almanac, however, Leeds Almanac, would come under fire by the Burlington Quakers almost immediately. Uh, Daniel Leeds' unique cosmology manifested itself in the Almanac. In an appropriate language, for the time, apparently, I didn't have any examples of any inappropriate language, but whatever, in astrological symbols were used in the... (laughs) Names and month names of the months and the days. So like he's using, um, he's using like the symbol for Mars or what have you, right? Yeah, to represent things. And he also includes some astrological medicine in his almanacs. And I don't know if that was in the original one, but what's an astrological medicine? Is that like if you are of this- bleeding? Bleeding? Bloodletting. Oh. Bloodletting is an example. Like, oh. um, if you're a certain sign, it's a good idea. That, like, if you need a treatment, it will tell you, like, when you should let the blood and stuff like that. Yeah. Um. Once again, uh, I want to, like, preface this by saying that, like, he was just a follower of a version of science that wasn't correct. Like, uh, he, he believed in the scientific method. He just followed a theory that was not correct at the time. The whole thing about science is it's iterative. And if you go back to the 1600s, those are those are some really old iterations. Yeah, those are some early iterations on the whole thing. (laughs) And actually early iterations. He uh, I think was Francis Bacon was responsible for the origin of the scientific method. And like this dude was like on board and like was proselytizing it in his works. So like. He wasn't, like, anti-science. He was, like, actually trying at the time to be better. And, like, I actually kind of empathize with Daniel Leeds a lot in this story because, like, a lot of his personal beliefs mesh with mine better, more than I, uh... Like, obviously, I have a more modern interpretation, but, like, the general philosophies that he has are, like, not that far off from my own, and I kind of feel a great deal of empathy for this person. Um, but regardless, the Burlington elders took great offense to this work, calling it pagan, right? Um, and they ordered copies of it to be gathered and destroyed. The Quakers then demanded Leeds explain himself at a Quaker meeting, 
resulting in the fan feeling rejected by a community that he had <laughs> thought of as his family. There's a, th- it's disturbingly similar to um, what happened to disco records. <laughs> it's, <laughs> like people just hating on disco until eventually they gathered all the disco not literally all but there was an event where they gathered all the yeah, disco yeah. records into a stadium and just fucking burned them <laughs> well that's that's like the same thing as like brook burning that's the same thing as uh yeah uh like it, it repeats time and time again right yeah it's, it's a rejection it's a rejection of something new or something changed right um and that's that's just kind of humans because we we really like to stay in a predictable lane so to speak yeah right um but regardless leads while shattered honestly uh he was not deterred by this and he published his magnum opus the temple of wisdom for the little world world in 1688 <laughs> There's, don't book, fuck with the guy who has his own printing press back then. He doesn't. So he doesn't have his own printing press, but his friend William Bradford does, and he's willing to print for him. And I, I, I think because um, Leeds was like a surveyor, he was making enough yeah. money that he could afford to print these things. And then, like, also he got sales from the Almanac and all that kind of stuff, yeah. right? Um, so he could afford to do this. He was not. He was. He was not like wealthy, wealthy, but he wasn't. There's poor. most people at the time likely wouldn't have been able to do this if they wanted to, but he was, while well, not crazy well off, had the resources and access to to be able to. Distribute yeah, and I do mean, this. the people who were educated enough to like write and like come up with these types of things generally were privileged enough that they had access to this kind of technology, yeah. right? Like it's it's one of those situations where the level of general education was such that like getting education in these things required at least some degree of money and like books are expensive, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So like they're less expensive than they were, but they're still kind of expensive, especially in the new world. Right. Cause you're talking about importing them and like, it takes a while for a book to go over the ocean and all that stuff. Um, but regardless, he became the first, author to have his work published in New Jersey who also happened to be a New Jersey author um and huh. in this book he attempted to introduce a unique blend of philosophy science and theology to the new world like honestly uh the description that I read about this book it seems like an interesting book yeah um cuz now it's not wholly his own words, I should note, because the book paraphrased and quoted wide swaths of uh, existing literature to present his view. However, I do want to point out he did at least cite his sources. There's, so that's good. So there's two really good things about that. One, source citing, big thumbs up to that guy. But also the the best way um, or easiest way to know the author or whoever created a thing is if they're drawing directly from resources, then you can look at those resources that they're drawing from. Yeah. And you, you can inform yourself on what that author yeah, is about. I, I mean, it's it's kind of, in, in terms of like, it's basically, he did a lot of stuff that was um, making knowledge commonplace, right? Yeah. And like, I recognize that this episode is not, like now that I'm talking, I recognize this episode is not as funny, but like, I think that this is actually a really important piece of history that's more or less lost. This man's, like, struggle and, like, the things that he went through, um, I don't personally recall it from history class, and he's not, like, a major player in anything, but, like, this struggle was happening in New Jersey, and, like, it's kind of important to some of, like, the way America develops. It is, and the other thing I like about this is that um, everything we've covered up to this point um, I'm generally aware of the Jersey Devil. I've listened to a plenty of Jersey Devil podcasts. This is including information that isn't available through other sources because they're drawing yeah. in in the more um well I guess uh, spectacular uh bits yeah, of it. I, I kind of wanted to go beyond the spectacular bits. I yeah. want to go beyond the sightings because like 
the Jersey Devil's been done to death, right? Um, but I, I, I digress. Let's get back to the actual story because we got a we still got a little bit ways to go. There's lots of um, new information. So, that's good. That's all I'm getting at. To Leeds, the book was a form of ministry, and it was yeah. deeply personal, like to his core personal. Um, unfortunately, however, once again, the Quaker elders rejected his book and quickly rounded up the few existing copies because um, the book was very long for the time, so it wasn't that hard. There weren't that many in circulation yet. Uh, uh, and they destroyed them, effectively creating the fact that there's only one tome, like copy of the tome that exists today. There's only one copy of this book left. Dang. Um, because of the actions of the Quaker elders, which more or less erased Daniel Leeds from history as a result. Um, not quite, but like, they did a pretty good job of like, deep sixing him. Oh, yeah. Now, I want to say, supervillains have absolutely been made over lesser crimes against a person. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, very true. Like, I'm pretty sure, like, uh, if my memory is correct, I think Lex Luthor became a supervillain because uh, Superman did something that caused him to lose his hair. <laughs> I surprisingly don't know the origin story of like, Lex Luthor, and um, that's funny I'm if like, it's true. I'm like 90% sure that that's true. Lex Let me see. Luthor origin Somebody has Lex Luthor nor net worth. Which Why? Is, and is it close uh, to yeah. Bezos? I don't That's know. That's interesting. Okay. So, Brandon. Yes. I found the origin story. Well, oh, uh, no. we took a slight break. Um, originally, here worshiping Superboy, teenage Lex Luthor of Smallville is determined to prove he is Earth's greatest scientist by creating artificial life. His recklessness and inexperiences causes a fire in his lab, and he calls on Superboy to save him. The Boy of Steel puts out the fire, but in the process, accidentally destroys the artificial life form and the years of research note that leads to its creation. While fumes from the chemical fire cause Luther's hair to fall out. Oh, Unwilling no. to hold himself responsible for the lab fire and the destruction of his own life's work, Lex Luthor decides Superboy was jealous of his intellect and caused the fire himself. Believing he's been betrayed by his hero and friend, Lex swears revenge. So, lesser slight than what uh, yeah. what uh, Le Daniel Leeds endured, right? For sure. Now, it's no surprise, Brandon, that Daniel Leeds now makes it his life's mission to be a thorn in the, the side of the Quakers. Like, yeah. dude goes hard on the Quakers. Like, in no uncertain terms, he goes ham on them um Gon was the man who generally donated a sizable sum to the construction of the church and in his place a political attack dog who endeavored to make his enemies lives absolutely miserable Leeds resurrected his almanac at the time converting it to a pamphlet um form affording him more pages to bear his grievances and attempt to raise the scientific literacy because remember that's still a key for him yeah. Um, in addition to standard astronomical events, advertisements, and schedules of local religious meetings, which ironically included the Quaker meetings. Oh, now, shoot. All right. as a, yeah. So, like, he still, like, he still has to report on it because, like, otherwise people aren't going to buy his thing. But it's kind of funny. Yeah. Now, as alluded to before, Leeds became an ardent, ardent critic of the Quakers, which earned him his fair share of backlash drawing him into what's known as the Quaker Pamphlet Wars <laughs> in, 19, in, 17, in 1697. Now, the actual mechanisms of the print war are actually really fucking interesting, and I recommend you refer to this week's source, The Secret History of the Jersey Devil, for more details on this particular pamphlet war. Because here's the thing, there have been many pamphlet wars in history. Like, it's a thing for some reason. And like it's there was more free time. They're basically sh they're basically shit posting trolls. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's great. Yeah, it's pretty great. Um, so that being said, here are some of the the pamphlet names at the time. Satan's harbinger encountered being something by way of answer to Daniel Leeds. <laughs> A challenge to Caleb Pussy. News of a strumpet <laughs> cohabitating in the wilderness. <laughs> oh. 
Oh. Daniel Leeds justly rebuked. The rebuker rebuked. The bomb searched and found. <laughs> I I love this... the titles and I like I love the fact Strumpet that... cohabitating in the in the wilderness is that's news somehow. Well, it's not news. This is not news. These are pamphlets. They put these out. They paid their own money to print these pamphlets and oh, then give them to yeah. people. I don't Jeez. know if they sold them because I don't know the mechanisms of that, but like they were paying their own money to just basically roast on other people. Yeah. And like I said, it's like the pamphlet writers of yore were Facebook shit posters mixed with trolls. Just at like slower speeds. But yeah. more importantly, however, Daniel Leeds at this time was explicitly called evil and a devil by his contemporaries. As such, the ver- a version of the Leeds devil is born. Perfect. That's key. So, like, at this point now, the name Leeds is associated with the devil. There is a chimera-like creature that lives in the woods. So, like, we've got all these, like, little, like, fragments that are coming together, right? We've got the name Leeds, Mother Leeds. It's just all, like, sort of coalescing into something. Now, here's the thing that I got wrong. Daniel Leeds dies in 1714, and his son, Felix and Titan Leeds, take up the mantle of publishing the Leeds Almanac. Felix would eventually bow out. Such a cool name for a kid. Titan? Titan? Hell yeah. Titan is a pretty great name. I'm not going to lie. That kid's bad. Although he can't can't name it. He has to be over six foot. Well, I'd I'd hold your... I'd, I'd reserve your claims of badassery for a second. Oh, boy. Because we're going to get into it. Um, it, it, nothing bad. He's just like, you'll see. Um, so eventually Titan became the, the sole, like, person who ran the Leeds Almanac. Now, unfortunately, Daniel's status as the harbinger of Satan would continue to haunt his son. And now, although Titan had a zeal for science, he had no interest in fighting Quakers, nor did he have really any talent for, like, rebutting people. Um. <laughs> oh, good. Like, he's just, like, not good at taking an insult. Like, his father was, like, spitting fire, but he's just, like, (laughs) they're not the same. Now, it wasn't actually the Quakers, though, who were the greatest thorn in Titan's side. Because, once again, doesn't give a shit about, like, fighting the Quakers. He just really wants to spread science literacy and write his his, uh, almanac. Now... The real threat to him was founding father Benjamin Franklin. Here we go. Yeah. So this is what I got wrong. The origin of the like of the Leeds well, Franklin. Well, let me, let me thing? Con- yeah. Let me yeah. let me keep going. So Franklin wanted to get it into the almanac through the Poor Richard's Almanac in 1732. So that's when he publishes the first volume of it. Now, being a shrewd businessman. Benjamin Franklin knows that his cheap competition is Titan Leeds' Leeds Almanac. And in an effort to secure the success of his almanac, he took aim at Titan in the 1733 edition of his personal almanac. And here's how he did it, Brandon. He predicted that Titan's death was October 17th of 1733. And... He claimed that Titan had a model that predicted it was October 26th. Um, Brandon. So, so one, if I would, that's a bad, here's the problem. If Titan doesn't die on the 17th of October, then Benjamin Franklin, at least, you know, his his predictions aren't that um, accurate. And if Titan then does die on the 26th that then proves that the then dead titans almanac was superior so you might think that brandon but benjamin franklin is way more clever than i'll ever be so franklin approached the feud through humor so like he was basically taking a shot at titans like as a joke basically okay titans however took it extremely seriously um retaliating in his own almanac saying Franklin has manifest himself a fool and a liar. There's, that's all he's, that's what he said. I miss these old timey insults. Yeah. Um, but then it gets better. So talking about the whole, like, so keep in mind, 
a, a cycle has gone by, right? So Benjamin Franklin releases his almanac. I don't know, like, I don't think it's the same year that Titan Leeds responds to it. It's literally the next year's almanac that he's responding to this in. Oh. So, like, this is, like, a three-year process. Yeah, that's fucking um, great, too. Right, because that, that doesn't, that means it's been stewing. It's been yeah. stewing so, for like, a year. It's it's stewing, and the best thing that that uh, Titan says is Franklin has manifest himself a fool and a liar. Meanwhile, after reading this, Franklin just slaps back in the best way possible. He responds that Leeds was too well bred to use any man so indecently and scurriously. As such, the individual who wrote in the Leeds almanac was not actually Titan. But a ghost claiming that he received much that that it was a ghost and that Franklin had received much abuse from the ghost of Titan Leeds. A notion that Benjamin Franklin would even continue past Titan's death in 1738. He would keep referring to Titan Leeds ghost in the Poor Richard's that, Almanac. That's amazing. And here's For like a <sighs> decade after he died. So Franklin, he uses his time right. Titan, I've sent out emails and like the yeah. day after, or like had phone conversations or meetings, whatever. And the day after, been like, ah, shit. And and then you think the day after in your head, like what the of the perfect response. Titan had so much time, and that's the oh, best yeah. he could come up with. And now, yeah, uh, uh, I. I, I haven't read the whole, like, rebuttal, but, like, it just doesn't slap in the same way that Ben Franklin Not says. Not at all. And now, I want to point out something, right? So, Titans would have been one of the leads alive during the supposed time frame of the Jersey Devil origin, 1735, right? Yes. So, it's notable that never once does Benjamin Franklin mention the Jersey Devil or Mother Leeds, or her monster spawn, which, if that was a thing that happened contemporarily, and actually was like a legend passed around, you better fucking believe Benjamin Franklin would have wrote about it. Yeah, like, why was it that like, I thought for some reason that came from poor Richard's almanac? It did. The Leeds Devil? Mean? For some reason well, I thought that's... the Leeds Devil came from poor Richard's. That's because that's that's a part of me fucking the story or someone else fucking the story. It had to be someone because right? this is this is before even any, any of this. This is yeah. from like for for like a few years. Yeah. I, I've been, I I thought that came from poor Richards. Yeah, so I think there's like a mimetic mutation that happened where yeah. like people believe that it was from poor Richards, but the origin of the story is not Benjamin Franklin specifically. He did not create the story whole cloth. However, in addition to Titan Leeds' work, uh, D- Daniel Leeds' work being destroyed summarily by the, the Quakers and this, like, teardown of Titan Leeds in the Poor Richard's Almanac and, like, the raise to fame of the Poor Richard's Almanac, the Leeds' legacy slowly fades from his history. The Almanac is shadowed. Daniel's book is nearly lost to time. The Leeds' name becomes a whisper in the Pine Barrens, and it slowly coalesces into the monstrous creature we know and love today. Because, Brandon, huh. what happened was Benjamin Franklin made the lead's name a whisper, right? But there was associations with the devil for lead's name. So you have devil, leads, and he's like public enemy number one for the Quakers, you know, all this stuff. So, like, he enters, Daniel Leeds enters the zeitgeist as the lead's devil in his own right, right? Yeah. You're, so you you're have destroying this... my idea of the Jersey Devil, John. Up until this but... point, I thought Benjamin Franklin wrote about the Leeds Devil in Poor Richard's Almanac about Daniel Leeds, not about Titan. And then he didn't even yeah. do that at all. You're destroyed. Uh. Yeah. I like so, this. Like, it's, this is fertile ground for a legend to crop up, a folk yeah. piece of folklore. Because there's all these seeds, right? Um, And, like, let me just also note that there's a concept that exists in the colonies of monstrous births, right? It's enmeshed in the public consciousness of the, the New World. Um, new World quotes, whatever. Uh, one specific example manifests in the form of Anne Hutchins, 
a Quaker woman who railed against the Puritans in the city of Boston in the 1630s and 1640s. In her story, she gave birth to her 16th child. Keep in mind, Anne Hutchins is a real person, as far as I can tell, um, who was born with a deformity. So it takes very little effort to connect her story to Mother Leeds because it's in the zeitgeist around the same time and she's a prominent figure who's like exiled from Boston and like one of her subsurd like her like one of the people she's friends with also has a child with a birth defor- defect as well. So you've got this like history of monstrous like birth. You've got a per- a woman who had a shit ton of kids and had a, a child with a, a deformity, and she was kind of regarded as a witch to the Puritans. So, like, you have all of these building blocks, like, lining up, and it's a region with these fearful forests, concepts of monstrous beings, and a reason for existence, a name associated with it, and it just all coalesced over the years. And we don't actually hear anything about the Jersey Devil until 1859. That's... In an article by oh. W. F. Mayer, wow. yeah, that's a lot later than I thought we were going to come on to. Like, yeah, a lot later. Well, so allegedly, there's like, it's it's folk legend in the area, right? It's like, you know, oh, watch out for the Leeds Devil. You know, it's one of those things that people like yeah. spread by word of mouth. So, Mayer's was writing an article in the Pines. The article itself was about the culture and inhabitants of the Pine Barrens known as Pineys or Pine Rats. Now, if you can't guess, they didn't exactly have a very high opinion of people who lived in the Pine Barrens. No. Um, (laughs) uh, So Hannah Butler describes a fairly uh, squalid lifestyle and alludes to a monster that inhabits the Barrens offhandingly calling it the Leeds Devil. This is the first occurrence of the Leeds Devil associated with a monster. After telling him this name, she refuses to offer him any more after pressed on the subject. Myers, guide, then, however, supplies him with the origin story that I presented at the start of the episode. And there's an there's an amend, a- amendation that the devil would eat children and attack lone women. So, like... There's also this thing, so, like, there's kind of this boogeyman aspect to the the Jersey Devil. Yeah. So, like, very, like, everything about the Jersey Devil is so paint-by-numbers to stuff we've talked about on this podcast. But, like, the way that you get to it is so, like, lost to time. And it's fucking wild. We have the, we have the, like, privilege nowadays, like, of more modern cryptids. There's, like, documentation about it. But, like, this is one that's, like, old enough that, like, it's not, like, you have to dig to get, like, to the origin. Now, that being said, Jersey Devil doesn't take off. Leeds Devil doesn't take off. It's still not called the Jersey Devil at this point. The next article to mention the creature appears 30 years later in 1887, which amends the origin, again, with minor changes to the circumstances, uh, but there is an addition of immunity to silver bullets. So now it's also like beyond supernatural. And then shortly after that, in 1893, a New Jersey engineer recounted a story in which the Leeds devil attacked him while driving his train. We're almost in the 1900s and now we're and adding werewolf things. <laughs> there's only, well, well, actually it's stronger than a werewolf because it's immune to silver bullets. Yeah. So uh. we're, we're, we're at only three documented documentations of the Jersey Devil, and we're almost 1900s. This is important, Brandon. Um, now, there are three events that people will mention in the chronology of the Jersey Devil, and I'm going to ca- talk about them right now, but they appear to be wholly apocrypha. So the first one is Joseph Bonaparte, the exiled king of Spain and the cousin of Napoleon Bonaparte. He's said to have seen the Jersey Devil while hunting, and allegedly had told the town folks of his encounter in the 1800s. Likewise, Commodore Stephen Decatur was said to have encountered the devil while visiting an ironworks in the Pine Barrens, with some embellishments adding that he even fired a cannon at the creature. Unsurprisingly, however, there is no primary source corroboration for either of these stories, which indicates their status as apocrypha, designed to enmesh famous historical figures into the story. 
An unreliable 1790 diary entry from woodsman Vance Lerner also exists referencing the beast. So, like, if this existed, then that would mean that this thing existed before the 1800s. Yeah. And, like, it was, like, more solid and, like, it gives more credence to the notion that it's actually a physical nuts and bolts thing. But um, it's likely a hoax because the original diary has no physical or, like, evidence of it, like, surround, like, existing anywhere in literature other than, like, people claiming it exists. Yeah, no. And, like, also... It, it, it like alleges that the the thing is like the size it's its horns are like its hooves are like around like as big as an oak's trunk which is really just fucking wild yeah no that that's almost like the um i'm drawing a blank that california woods demon thing that uh the guys from vhs uh adopted, oh yeah and then it's... and then made that the uh, like story about the monk from like way way earlier to try to lend credit to the, the it, hoax it's it's basically the same thing and it's kind of wild i still can't get over that thing that's a whole nother <laughs> fucking... it was funny because i i still remember the second that i saw the vhs like the video i was like this is made by the vhs guys holy shit oh yeah <laughs> um god i can't get that that's such as a soon as you clever... see the video too you're like this is the same guys <laughs> Yeah, it's like, oh, oh, I know who did this. Yeah. Which is hilarious to me. Now, Brandon, there was some coverage of the Leeds Devil in the early 1900s. In 1905, the Leeds Devil re-enters public consciousness with two articles, one published by J. Elfrith Watkins and another by Arminus Alba. The two articles presented the story of the Leeds Devil to the public in response to strange, unrecognizable hoof prints that had been appearing in the snow in the Pine Barrens, which... We did. You covered that in episode thirteen of this podcast. <laughs> you covered the devil's footprints. Yep. So similar phenomena. Just copy and paste everything we talked about in that episode right here. Also copy and paste all the jokes. So like, <laughs> if you laugh at that one, that's that's this episode's. Uh, that that's added to the the comedy of this episode by the transitive property. Um. Now. Between 1905 and, 19, and 1909, the Leeds Devil rises to prominence, right, in the region. Um, until one Philadelphia resident, Norman Jeffries, read a Leeds Devil article and had an idea. Now, Brandon, Norman Jeffries was an employee of a man named Charles A. Bradenburg. And Bradenburg owns something called the Ninth and Arch Dime Street Museum. Now, oh boy! All right, this huh, is this a similar thing to the Dime Museum that came up in uh, the episode where we did uh, Oofty Goofty. Yeah, it's basically the same thing. Oh, good. It's 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 literally just a stationary slideshow. Um, so like fat women, living skeletons, acrobatics, you know, Oofty Goofty type things. It's 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 a like Ripley's Believe It or Not like house type thing so now when jeffries read the article the business had been struggling and they needed a new gimmick to get people into the building now jeffries wanted to use the leeds devil to draw people to the place of work to ensure his job so he pitches this idea to bradenburg who was all for the leeds devil grift and he entrusts tf compkins as the manager of the the con and norman jeffries as a press agent Jeffries then begins inserting stories about the Leeds Devil into the local press, alleging sinister behaviors and scandalizing the populace. Surprisingly, Brandon, this works. It draws people to the museum, despite the fact they have nothing to show for it. And it was about this time that the more common name for the Leeds Devil, now at least, oh. emerges. The Jersey Devil is coined. Man, it's all um, coming together. It's it it's it's something else, Brandon. Um, it's like the media, like media created this creature, whole cloth, right? Yeah. Every step of the way, with the exception of the Nanape tradition, is like a facet of media contributing to the creation. Of yeah. This thing. Holy it's, cow! It's wild. It's so wild, and. 
The worst part is media is no different. It's so, it would so, it's so likely that they'll do this again. This is no different than anything shared by like anyone's uncle on Facebook. I mean, it's literally what happened with Slenderman, basically. Yeah, like, holy cow. Th- this, <laughs> I hate to admit it, but the Jersey Devil is effectively early 1900s Slenderman. Yeah. Deal with that. It's, uh <laughs> Now, that being said, Jeffries didn't have everyone tricked. One editor who refused to run the story was basically like, I I know you're full of shit, dude. You should end the ruse. Basically suggesting, like, end the ruse or I'm going to, like, spill the tea. Um, Now, being con men, Jeffries and Bradenburg wanted to milk every last drop from the Jersey Devil and got in contact with a local taxidermist who then got them in contact with an animal trainer in New York. Now, the men wanted an animal that was close to the Jersey Devil in appearance so they could adjust it to more closely resemble the Jersey Devil for one last hurrah on the, the museum. This is a, akin to, like, the Fiji, Fiji, uh, the Fiji mermaid, mermaid. Yeah. or the Cardiff Giant, those those types of things, like B.T. Barnum Bailey, you know, all that, that kind of shit, right? So, after a few days after getting in contact with the trainer, they receive a live kangaroo, Brandon. Oh, Fantastic. Perfect. They then paint stripes on the kangaroo. Even better. And strap a pair of homemade wings onto its back. They hire a Ringling Brothers circus clown named George Harzell and some of his friends to be monster hunters. This cadre of clowns were then to go on an expedition to capture the beast and bring it back to Philly, where it would be displayed in the museum. What happens next honestly sounds like a bad movie joke. I want to see... One, the wings. I want to see the wings because I can't imagine prop wings being that hot back then, looking any good. And then also how they're affixed to the kangaroo because a dead giveaway about wings not being real would be a harness. (laughs) Well, so we'll get into how this all worked in a second. Oh, does it get Um, sad? It does get sad. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Good. It is about to get sad. Um, So the group enters the forest, and those outside the woods hear gunshots as well as the screams of a man man and beast. The party emerges soon after, triumphantly, with a cart carrying a blanket-covered cage, which shook and screeched as they brought it to the, quotes, museum. The next day, the papers advertised that not only had the Leeds Devil been caught, but it was on display at the 9th and Arch Street Dime Museum. Oh, good. So the monster, Brandon, yeah, was presented on a darkened stage covered by a curtain. The creature was then revealed to the gathered crowd and poked with a stick with a nail in it by an unseen boy. The effect was monstrous as the beast jumped around and screamed as it attempted to flee from its tormentor. The crowd, however, roared with fright, spending literally thousands of dollars to see the creature. <laughs> That's how many people visited. Oh, Unsurprisingly, man. the usage of the kangaroo further alters the story and causes some future witnesses to see a flying kangaroo. And it's also like a part of like the Jabberwocky like thing. And it's just, it's insane. So the ruse would continue for several weeks, and but the hoax was eventually let out of the bag and the kangaroo was allowed to return to New York. Of course, they wouldn't let it back to Australia, but that's a whole other thing. Yeah, now, that explains all the the uh, wild kangaroos I see roaming around. Yeah. That does happen, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> it's been the topic so, of other other episodes. It's just people it has explicit, running out of money and en- having to let their zoos loose. Yay, private it is zoos. Literally, it is literally the Enfield Horror the second episode of this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> um, also, just as a side note, the museum eventually closes down soon after. Um, I guess they were just going out of style. Um, so at this point, the Jersey Devil is fully formed. Monster hunts, sightings, they explode for the devil. In the 50s and 60s, interest gets renewed as cryptozoology explodes on the scene. To cryptid hunters on the East Coast, the Jersey Devil is an accessible target for hunting and exploration. Sightings erupted and bounties were posted for the creature. 
Likewise, at least three organized groups still exist today that hunt the Jersey Devil, Brandon. On, I am not joking. Oh, good. There are at least three groups. And now, despite the clear hoax behind its popularization, the Jersey Devil still persists as a popular mythical creature in New Jersey. Its origins are shrouded in the faded history, although when examined, a coherent story emerges, painting the path from disillusioned Quaker to a cryptozoological phenomenon. Now, Brandon, you'll notice that I didn't talk much about sightings on this episode. That's no. because, honestly, the sightings of, like, the sightings of um, the Jersey Devil are not that interesting in their own right. However, there are two exceptions. Okay. They happened with, on the, in the same week. Now, in 2015, David Black claims to have seen and photographed the Jersey Devil. Now, Brandon, just scroll down a little bit and take a look at that picture. I would describe that as a hyper-realistic living animal caught on a clear uh, photograph. <clears throat> Definitely yeah, not would, would... some form of stuffed goat that is... <laughs> Someone just tossed a fucking stuffed goat in the air. <laughs> I mean, they might have tossed a regular goat in the air too. <laughs> that make me and strapped shattered. wings onto it. <laughs> um, but like Brandon, if you look at the picture, there's motion blur that is not like a like proper for the type of photo being taken. No, and like so here's like oh you know what it was, the goat was probably stationary when the photo was taken actually. Yeah, because they, for, they abs- yeah for for the goat that's in motion to have the exact same amount of motion blur as the trees that are stationary because they're trees, um, yeah. Either the, the the goat had to be stationary and the camera was moving when it was taken, or it was taken yeah. and the the motion blur was added afterwards. Yeah, it's it's very 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 clearly fake. Yeah, right. But here's the thing, and I don't know if he's a Poe. Or not? In the article that I found, he says he wants to alert the community, saying that the creature could snatch children out of cribs and steal so- souls. So I have no idea if this person's a hoaxer, a jokester, or whatever, but, like, either reality is equally hilarious to me. Yeah, um, so I can't find the exact one in the five and a half seconds I've been looking, but you can find some pretty high-quality prop goats on the internet um of surprisingly of better quality than his for seven dollars and 56 cents i found a 17 dollar one available from walmart that's actually higher quality than his yeah it's a very affordable thing to do yeah it's it's incredibly affordable now brandon it gets fucking funnier so there's a link and I'm going to ask you to click that link in a second. Um, it includes a video posted in Weird New Jersey by Emily Martin that was allegedly taken nine miles away from the um, from the site of the original picture. Okay. So, Brandon, watch this video. Describe it a little bit to All me. All right. True New Jersey. Jersey Devil or Halloween Prank. It's a dark... What? Hang on. <laughs> All right, so we've got ourselves a camera filming um, at the top of a tree line, which we will later find Mm -hmm. they're filming at the spot where something will... You have... The person shooting the video knew something was going to be there before they started shooting the video. They're already aiming at the one spot it's going to show up. And then we have ourselves... (laughs) And then we have ourselves a a stuffed goat with... um, Oh, God... Uh, here's what I'm gonna guess it, th- here's a way this could have been, it's a shittier stuffed goat than the first one, first of all, um, and it, it's moving through the, the, the screen with flapping wings, and you think to yourself, flapping wings, how, how would you do that? Well, a, like, probably 12-year-old Brandon had something called air hogs, do you remember air hogs when you were a kid? Yeah. They sold not just air hogs um, that had propellers, but air hogs that had flapping wings. And I had air hogs that had flapping wings. So you might notice that there's no sound of electronics or motors going, and that's because it's all compressed air. You pump it up with a bike pump. So someone could have duct taped the bat wing 
air hog thing that I had as a kid to a stuffed goat and then pulled it through the screen. <laughs> So Brandon, I think it's wor- I think it's simpler than that. Like I think you're giving them too much credit. Because it's completely silent. Like literally nothing. You would have heard oh, it is the silent. goat. It is totally silent, oh. but there is sound. I noticed I couldn't hear it, any motors. But Yeah, and then you You hear the, the then, person go oh, like breathe in a little bit. Wow. Right? Yeah. Brandon, I'm pretty sure they just filmed something when Wow, and then composited a very like bad Jersey Devil animation flitting across the screen. It does have, so it is fully black. There's no, I'm going through all there the is, different frames. There is nothing. There's no definition to it. So that could just be a mask that they put over. Oh. Yeah, it is entirely oh. possible. And Brandon, this is what. They put in less work than the Mark- low effort thing that I thought. You you were like being complicated and like pra- using practical effects. Duct they didn't even a bother. Teddy bear. Yeah, um, Martin had this to say about her sighting, by the way, and this is pulled from Snopes. I realize this sounds crazy, but I saw a red animal with a long neck and horns. I swear on my mother's grave, this is not a joke. I pulled over to take a video and started filming. I got its hind legs. It got on its hind legs and flew away. I am a middle school teacher, but moonlight tutoring algebra for high school t- students. I was driving home from an appointment at Old Port Republic Road in Leeds Point when I took the video. So excited to share it with someone. I searched online and a few others have similar stories. Channel 12 posted a photo of it online. So just going through the comments, it looks like... um. A lot of people aren't buying it, but the person to whom... Um, I think is the closest is Brett one Lewis from five years ago. And he says, I'm pretty sure that's Watto from star Wars episode one. Basically. basically. <laughs> so Brandon, thank you for coming with me on this journey of the Jersey devil. It was a journey. Um, it was a journey. And I only have one thing left to say about the Jersey devil. The story is in many ways, the encapsulation of Jersey itself. It's full of shit. <laughs> well thank you everyone this has been cryptopedia uh our website is cryptopediacast.com our instagram is at cryptopediacast our twitter is also at cryptopediacast we have an email cryptopediacast at gmail.com or us at cryptopediacast.com we also have a patreon and brandon will you thank our jackalopes yes thank you clay sinclair marty von party Bird, the hollowest bone Schneider, Jonathan Shepard, and Matthew Smith. What? Who's that? Matthew Smith. Is that the doctor? Not. Oh, I didn't even think about that. The former doctor. Um, Presently, uh, uh, Jody, and now it's going to switch to someone that's unannounced. I like Jody. Jody Whitaker. Yeah. Um, Yeah, she's fun. Uh, We also have a Facebook group, which is... Search up on Facebook if you really want. I don't post But join there. our Discord. Yeah, join the Discord. That's where, like, the real stuff pops off. We've had a few people join and then immediately quit. And I um, don't know if that's immediately related to, to me trying to, like, force a, it, a, a D&D-esque roleplay. Um, it also might be related to cursed images. So, like, that's oh, a whole thing, Oh, yeah, our channels. Um, Yeah, if you enjoy the podcast, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, all that stuff. Um, share it with a friend. I know that, like, for whatever reason, they've made it harder for uh, people to leave reviews and stuff on, like, podcasts, which I think, honestly, is... I'm going to be a conspiracy... I'm going to put on my tinfoil hat, Brandon, and I think it's to, like, keep independent, like, podcast producers down a little bit. But that's, that's a whole other thing. not... Not surprising as more podcasts are going to, like, only available on X platform. Certain platforms, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a little shitty, but whatever. Um, if you have any monster requests or stories, send them, because we finally have the Jersey Devil done after a year and a half. There's, I'm excited. You've been knocking out these A-listers. You did the Chupacabra. You did the Jersey Devil. I know we've got some A-listers that are future things, possibly. Um. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the the 
we've we've got some good episodes coming up um from like the things that everyone knows but like i'm gonna take a slight turn on it and i'm every single one of these i'm definitely talking about something that is not common public knowledge it's so the jersey get ready devil i legit liked this because it shed a lot of knowledge that was dude not comp that i thought Things that I thought were common knowledge, like Benjamin Franklin wrote in Poor Richard's Almanac to Daniel Leeds, just not true. Daniel Leeds wasn't even alive. He when don't poor be Richard's dead. Almanac. That boy yeah. don't be dead. Yeah. So like, it's I, I read this story in like a day, and like I was just like, this is this is wonderful. I love everything that I'm reading here. This is hilarious. Um, other than of course like the misogyny. And like, oh, the, the misogyny and the colonialism. Yeah, that 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 I'm not a fan of. But like yeah. that that's common to all 98 episodes. Yeah, I mean, you kind of can't have an episode of Cryptopedia in which colonialism doesn't show up. I'm gonna be completely frank with you. Yeah, they they kind of just show up, and like, I'm not a fan. Don't get me wrong. I'm, there's I'm no fan of it, but like, it kind of just happens. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, um yeah. you could find me on Instagram at donkey underscore hands. Uh, my website is boyerb.com. My email is Brandon at cryptopediacast.com, and my Twitter is at crypto Brandon. Um, I'm on Instagram at mute twenty fifty seven. Twitter at JF Dunham. My website is John Dunham Games, and my email is john at cryptopediacast.com. Our art was done by Tom Hill. You can find him on Instagram at Thomas Michael Hill. His website is greatergloryco.com, and his email is tommikehill at gmail.com. As always, I'm John. I'm Brandon. And things are gonna get weird. <laughs> Not that's, the Pornhub intro noise. this time. <laughs> oh, I forgot to make a joke about how OnlyFans no longer supports sexual content, so I can't be a Japanese messy boy anymore. Wait, it doesn't? Yeah, they, they took it off. Like, you can't have explicitly sexual content on OnlyFans anymore. Then what's it for? <laughs>